Thank you very much, Faith. As Faith uh, mentioned to you, uh, we have known each other a very long time. And I'm sorry, I need to get closer, don't I? That's what usually is it. You have to get your mouth up there and practically eat the microphone. OK, here we are. Uh, Faith and I have, as she said, been present, been together in this struggle against genocide for many, many years. Um, she was one of the very first people that uh, was part of the, our coalition that made the whole campaign against genocide possible. Uh, we were just talking uh, and realized this morning both of us are preacher's kids. She, I was a Presbyterian preacher's kid. She was a Salvation Army preacher's kid. So we've both been brought up in the faith. So she's got the right name, that's for sure, uh, faith. I was named after a pope, after Pope Gregory, because even though my father was a Presbyterian minister, he said, we're going to name you after a pope because we're Presbyterians, but we're Presbyterian Catholics. Don't ever forget it. And uh, I've always felt that that was a real gift because anywhere you go now, because after all, Pope Gregory was what, about the seventh century or something? Everywhere you go, there's an equivalent for your name. You know, there's a Gregorio and a Gregoire and all that kind of thing. So nobody has trouble figuring out what your name is anymore. I want to begin this session, however, with a personal note. Because I believe strongly that through Jesus Christ, we know that God is personal. That is what is so different about Christianity. It is what makes Christian faith unique. God isn't some force up in the sky by and by or something. And of course, God created the universe. But God loves every single one of us personally. That is an amazing thing. Just think about it. It's amazing. And I have a special, special reason for saying that. I was converted by an Egyptian. I went to a camp in the summer of my 13th year. Of, you know, one of those uh, camps by the lake where the boys meet the girls and, you know, all of that kind of thing happens. Uh, but there was an Egyptian missionary who had been chosen by that conference uh, team to be our preacher for that conference. He knew me inside out. It was as though he knew the inside of my soul. And he, for the first time in my life, made it clear to me that God loved me even more than my parents. And I didn't even have any concept of how that could possibly be. But because I had wonderful parents, and I knew they loved me. But I was sitting by the lake one day, one morning. We had morning watch. And I began to read, in Hebrews, this passage about how we shouldn't be discouraged. Because uh, it was a time of discouragement. I was 13, my gosh, 13-year-olds, you know, People almost forget it by the time they're adults. It is a very hard time in life when you're 13 and 14 and don't know who you are and don't know. And I read this, this chapter in Hebrews, and it said, Do not be discouraged in the discipline of the Lord, for he disciplines only him whom he loves. And I felt God's presence. I, I knew I had felt it before, after I felt it, but it was no question that that's what it was. It was God. And God is so real to each of us personally. From that point forward in my life, I have been a Christian. Even though I had been raised, you know, in a preacher's, as a preacher's kid, I hadn't met Jesus Christ personally. After that, I had. And it changed my life, changed my life in so many ways, I can't even begin to thank God enough. I 
want to share with you a passage from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, just to put in perspective where we are today. People in all the world who are Christians are being persecuted, still being persecuted. And I want to read to you in Acts 12 how early that started. Because this chapter is about what happened in 34 AD. This is only a couple of years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I, I think it's very appropriate at the beginning of a conference to begin with God's word. About that time, Herod Agrippa, the king, laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people and to kill him. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. The very night when Herod was about to bring him out to be killed, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door was guarded by the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up, quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your mantle around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was done by the angel was real. He thought it was a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and immediately the angel left him. And Peter came to himself, and he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying for him. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not even open the gate, but ran in and told that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you must be crazy. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. So here was Peter. Here was the early church, 34 AD, and the rulers were already killing the Christians. Well, that has continued in the history of the Coptic Church. It's never let up. In 634 Diocletian, the Roman emperor decreed that all Christians should be slaughtered, and hundreds of thousands of Christians were killed. When the Arab invaders came into Egypt and conquered Egypt, around the end of the 1630s, uh, 630s, 630 AD, 641 AD, they again began persecuting the Christians. And they even passed a, uh, a law, uh, and you're still under that law in Egypt. It's never changed. Uh, this is, these are the, uh, the Pact of Umar which was passed at the very beginning of 
you know, the seventh century AD, six, after the Arab conquest. Here's some of the, here's some of the law in the uh, Pact of Umar. Prohibition against building new churches, monasteries, or even synagogues, and prohibition against rebuilding destroyed churches, Worship in places for non-Muslims had to be lower in elevation than the lowest mosque. Does this all sound familiar? Yes. Uh, the houses of non-Muslims must not be taller in elevation than the houses of Muslims. A prohibition against hanging a cross on the churches. Mur Muslims had to be allowed to enter the churches anytime. Christians could not enter the mosques. I mean, you go through this list, and you are what, you're looking at current law in Egypt. In other words, this persecution that started at the start, started at the beginning of the history of the Christian church, is still law in Egypt. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by Christians who have come down through 2,000 years of persecution and still being persecuted around the world. And we are still supported by the hand of God. We are still able to escape from the prisons in which we are placed, in which the chains are broken from our wrists in which the iron gates are opened of their own accord, in which we can walk out and still preach and still witness and still serve. Because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has given, up, given us a power that is the very power of God himself. Thank you.